Greetings, my name is Monty Martin. And I'm Kelly McLaughlin. And, and we, we are, are the Dungeon, Dungeon Dudes. Dudes. Welcome to our channel where we cover everything D&D, including advice for players and guides for Dungeon Masters. We upload new videos on Tuesdays and Thursdays, so please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. So today, we're going to do a little bit of D&D myth busting. We've been doing a lot of recent videos lately that involve exploration and infiltration, party compositions, ranking the classes in certain party roles, and we've seen an abundance of comments that say, if you don't have a rogue, what are you doing about traps and locked doors? And we thought that we would analyze this question and actually look at what a party can do if they don't have a rogue and still be able to handle traps and locked doors effectively. Make no mistake, beyond their ability to be awesome in combat by landing sneak attacks, rogues are amazing in exploration, infiltration, and social interaction, especially given their ability to find and disarm traps as well as open locks. However, that's where the misconception comes into play, because as recently as 3rd edition and 3.5, the ability to disarm traps, in particular magical traps, and open locks and also do things like use magical devices even though they're not magical characters was exclusive to the rogue in 3.5 in particular the rogues had a trap finding class feature which said explicitly that a rogue and only a rogue could disarm a trap with a dc of above 20 or even find one like that in the first place and additionally rogues were the only class that could interact with magical traps of any kind at least as far as being able to dis disable them however that's the misconception here because that's not true anymore fifth edition has streamlined a lot of rules and made things easier to access for many of the classes in the game and so people who are coming from previous editions might have a mindset that in order to deal with a trap or a locked door, you need to have a rogue in the party. And we've seen a number of comments that state, hey, what are you going to do if your party has a ranger, a druid, and a bard, and you come to a trap and a locked door? Guess you're out of luck. And Monty and I were both thinking that that seems like a misconception. And so we thought today we're going to crack open the books. We're going to look at some of the options available and we're going to find out how to be capable with traps and locked doors, even if you don't have a rogue, while still highlighting why the rogue might be one of the best options for this. But you're not out of luck if you don't have one. There's a lot to look at today. So let's get rolling. So kicking things off. We want to continue what we talked about earlier and really focus on the fact that in 5th edition D&D, skills and tool proficiencies are not exclusive to any class. Any character in the game can gain proficiency in investigation and perception, and any character in the game can use those skills to locate or find a trap. Now, it should be noted here that rogues do have a little bit of a benefit in this category because they inherently get proficiency in thieves tools. They're also a class that gains expertise and are the only class in the game who has the option of applying their expertise ability to thieves tools. So many classes do have the option of using thieves tools to disarm traps and unlock doors and can get really good proficiency bonuses in doing so. But the rogue's definitely capable of getting the highest ability score in Thieves' Tools. It is worth noting that artificers automatically get proficiency in Thieves' Tools, and any character can take a background, such as criminal or a custom background, that gives them proficiency in Thieves' Tools, and then they can use those tools as well. So there are other classes like bards that get expertise, or rangers, in fact, can get expertise through canny, but both these classes have to choose a skill. They can't choose a tool for expertise. Furthermore, uh, any character could take a feat like prodigy or skill expert, which gives you expertise in a skill, but you can't choose a tool to be your expertise option there. In fact, the only other way that we could find in the rules for a character to gain expertise, thus doubling their proficiency bonus in these tools, is actually the artificer who gets tool expert automatically at six level. And so incidentally, what this means is that rogues have to choose thieves tools as one of their expertise options 
And if I've looked across many of the rogues that I've had as player characters, most often rogues choose stealth and deception, and then they choose perception and maybe thieves tools. I don't necessarily see every rogue take advantage of the fact that they can choose thieves tools as an expertise, but every artificer of sixth level and higher has expertise in thieves tools. Now, this is where we get to the misconception though, is it, it does stand out to say that the rogue has built-in options that allow them to be one of the best in the games at using thieves tools to disarm traps and open mm -hmm. doors. But to say that all other classes can't do it is the misconception. Yes. Because when we really look at it, a rogue who has expertise in thieves tools at first level and a 16 in dexterity is going to have a plus seven to using their thieves tools mm -hmm. on traps and locked doors. Whereas the bard who might have a 14 in dexterity and not able to take expertise will have a plus four. That's a significant difference. But also I, sh I will say that a plus four in using your thieves tools is not to be frowned at. At first level, being able to roll a d20, add four and hope you beat most average locks mm. is gonna get you there. And as the bard continues to level up, they're never going to reach the highs of the rogue, but eventually you're going to have maybe a plus eight, nine, or ten in your ability to unlock doors and traps. Yeah, so I think that when it comes to actually making the skill check to unlock a door or a trap, there's no question the rogue is best at it. This is where things get a little bit muddier, because a bard is a spellcaster, and so a bard with that plus four bonus could cast enhance ability on themselves and potentially give themselves advantage on their skill check when it comes to disarming that trap or unlocking that door. Now, of course, if the bard and the rogue are in the same party together, as the bard, you'd probably want to cast Enhance Ability on the rogue and have them be the ones to disarm the trap because if they still fail, they're the ones that are going to get blown up and not you, and that's the smarter play. <laughs> but if we're talking about a party without a rogue, yeah. then the bard is fully capable. And I think uh, even characters like the ranger is fully capable, the druid. Even the, a monk. Even a monk. Yeah. My shadow monk took the criminal background mm -hmm. and had proficiency in thieves tools, was able to sneak into places, unlock doors, disable traps. I've had artificers disable yeah. traps. I've had barbarians disable traps in very different ways. And we're going to talk about that in a second, that it's not exclusive to using thieves tools either. Yeah. You've even started to hint at that with using a spell like Enhance Ability to change the tides of how dealing with traps and locked doors would work. Yeah. The other thing that goes hand in hand with disarming traps is that you have to actually know they're there before you can disarm them. And this is where I think the rogue greatly falls into parity with the other classes in the game. Because I don't think that there's any convincing argument to say that rogues in 5th edition are any better at finding traps than any other class in the game. Rogues often do have good wisdom and intelligence scores, and they often choose proficiency and even expertise in perception and investigation but lots of other classes can get expertise in perception investigation, not inherently, they might have to take, take a feat for it. But on the other hand, clerics and druids will have a very high wisdom score, in many cases a much higher one than the rogue, or even in, an intelligence score from the artificer or the wizard, means that I've had a lot of parties where the person who found the trap was the cleric, the druid, or the other character with a high wisdom score, and then the rogue was the one that disabled it. I have a wizard at my table right now who has very high intelligence, great investigation, and has taken the observant feat. Mm. And their passive perception basically means that they can detect most traps yeah. better than casting the fine trap spell. <laughs> well, of course, the fine trap spell doesn't actually find traps. <laughs> no. Which is which is worth, worth noting. Um, but there are other ways that you can start using your spells to help you find traps. My One of the most notable ones is that if you're looking for a magical trap, the detect magic spell can be a key way of even pinging on the radar that a magical trap is there. And in some cases, it might only be possible to f see that a magical trap is there by using a spell like detect magic. And unless you're playing an arcane trickster rogue and you've given up the one non-enchantment or illusion spell that you can get to get detect magic, rogues have no access to this spell. The rogue that I play has a famous rule that I use at the table, which is sometimes the best way past a trap is to spring it. 
And although the rogue might not always go for that, even though I'm playing a rogue and that's his <laughs> attitude, the barbarian and the fighter and the paladin, your really beefy characters, can definitely play by that rule. And I yeah. think that's that's something else, is that sometimes finding a trap is just the barbarian being like, I think there might be a trap in this hallway, and they charge down it before <laughs> the rest of the party getting blasted with fire, and they're like, look out, there's a fire mm. there. There's a wonderful indie film called The Gamers, about a D&D campaign that actually makes a joke of this by having a rogue try several times to sneak down a trapped hallway without springing a trap only to get killed several times and then the barbarian just walks forward gets hit by the trap but survives because he has so many hit points and in in many cases it can simply be easier or better for the party as a whole to just have someone really tough tank the damage and especially with magical traps, you might have someone that has evasion that is not a rogue that just dodges the trap. Like, that's actually a legitimate thing. I've seen rogues spring traps and dodge the fireball and not take any damage from it. And that was a more reliable way of getting past the trap than actually trying to disarm it. Um, on the other hand, you might have characters that have fire resistance, that have resistance to those damage types. The barbarian is raging and resists whatever damage types are coming out uh, coming out that way or even just the party in general has really high saving throws and resists whatever magical effect is going to come out of there the dwarf has poison resistance dwarfs have stone cunning too so they might be able to use that to locate the traps in the first place beyond the observant feat you can also take a feat like alert or even dungeon delver which is very specific for helping you find and locate traps and deal with them in many ways. And actually, I'm pretty sure you've had some stories with Dungeon Delver. Yeah, so I actually did have a player character in one of my campaigns, Tomb of Annihilation, take the Dungeon Delver feat. And there is a absolute death trap, kind of meat grinder roller sort of trap at one point in Tomb of Annihilation. And it's meant to be like one of those instant kill traps. But it turned out that this player character, because they took Dungeon Delver, was actually capable of surviving the damage. And it led to a situation where they fell into an area where it was hard for them to get out. <laughs> and so when we start really thinking about it, there are so many other ways to bypass traps and locked doors that don't involve skills or thieves tools. Yeah, and, and I think beyond just using your other party members to find and detect traps, I think the classic method of... There's a famous story of a group surviving the, the Tomb of Horrors by getting a sh herd of sheep and sending them through the halls of the dungeon ahead of them. Pluto Jackson in our campaign was the trap setter offer because he had a bag of tricks. Uh, and so he would just throw animals down a hallway. Uh, now, trigger warning for an animal cruelty here. They're but... magical animals. They go back to their state of non-existence. They don't die horribly. They just go poof. Whatever helps you sleep at night, Kelly. It helps me sleep at night, <laughs> so I'm going with it. Um, but, of course, I also have seen players use their familiars in similarly callous ways or summoned creatures by sending them forward to their inevitable and horrific deaths in order to detect a trap ahead. In my home game the other night, the Artificer, who has their companion because they're playing a battlesmith, sent the companion into a room that they were worried was going to be trapped. The trap that I had in mind was that it was going to fill with poison, and the companion was immune to poison damage. Mm. So what mm -hmm. happened is the, the companion has claws, and so just walked around the room. Every time it stepped on a tile that caused poison to fill, it would put an X on the tile, and then they were able to go into the room after and avoid the poison tiles. I mean, you could also use spells like Mage Hand to poke things. Um, there's also the classic 10-foot pole. Anyone can carry a 10-foot pole. Um, you might want to even use Bigby's Hand or Telekinesis or Animate Objects. There's a whole bunch of spells that you can use to sort of prod the environment and sort of force a trap to spring so that that way you know what's going to happen. And as we get into the topic of spells and abilities, so we've already mentioned the companions and familiars and bag of tricks, but really if you have access to summoning spells at all, this is a great way to just bulldoze through a trap. Yeah, because if the trap doesn't reset, that's it. <laughs> yeah. If it's like a boulder that has to roll down the hallway and you get you squish a few animals that you summoned again, they're magic animals, uh, then the trap finished and the same thing applies as we move on to other spells and really when you start to think about dungeon design i i think that teleportation is is really a key way to get past a lot of dangerous things absolutely 
even from very low levels of play, characters have access to spells like Misty Step. And then at higher levels, they'll get things like Thunder Step, Dimension Door, Full-on Teleport, and all these other sort of teleportation effects in between. And in many cases, you know, you can jump over a pit trap. Um, you might not be able to jump over, say, a spray of poison darts that are coming out from the wall, but you can definitely Misty Step right past that. Yeah. Um, and so at that point, it, it doesn't matter. Um, yes, the trap is still active, so you're going to have to think about what's going to happen on your way out, but... Using a spell slot is a guaranteed way of just getting right past that trap without even any harm to you. I do think it's worth noting, though, that um, one of the things that I did see in the comments was the rogue disabling the trap allows the whole party to go past. Indeed. Whereas as we talk about some of these spells, everybody needs to have access to them. But at the same time, when you have Dimension Door, you can take two people. Mm -hmm. If you start looking at a spell like Fly... now. Inside of a dungeon, fly might be hard to use, but really, fly being cast on the whole party, allowing you to soar over a pit trap or over dangerous tiles that might trigger something, or even, oh no, the door to the castle is locked, but if we cast fly and fly in through that top tower window, we're in the castle anyways. Yeah, and there may be opportunities where you can safely split the party. You're taking a risk when you do this, but sometimes... You might just need to dimension door two people on the other side of the door and have them open it from the other side. That's a risk, but it is one that that is there, right? That it is a possible solution. You could also use even spells like knock to open a locked doors, or a spell like passwall does actually open a passage that everyone can go through. There's also other spells like stone shape. Um, that will allow you to have interesting ways to get through even solid walls um, that might even give you options for se sending several party members through there. So there are spells that will facilitate multiple party members getting past the obstacle. I also really think that if we open it up to even more spells, we have things like Spider Climb. Uh, I think Gaseous Form yeah. is incredible for getting past a lot of problems. Wind Walk, we have Etherealness, even Blink to some degree could be used to bypass certain things. So being aware of your spell selection, and if you're in a party that doesn't have a rogue, but you've got a bard, a wizard, a cleric, and a druid, uh, they're all probably going to have mm -hmm. access to some way to bypass a trap or a locked door. I've also seen, and I've seen this many, many times, where the party climbs into a bag of holding and one character then uses the, the, the one ability. Um, of what, whatever it is. I've even seen instances where, where the rogue has been the one who snuck ahead invisibly while carrying the party in a bag of holding. So this is kind of a classic sort of cheese ball technique and you know, you might your mileage may vary with whether or not your DM lets this one fly. And again, it's always a risk whenever your plan involves one party member going off alone or the entire party getting into a bag of holding. I would say I've seen that blow up in the party's face as often as I've seen it work. So think ahead with those ones. <laughs> <laughs> Lastly on the spell list, though, I think that I want to talk about Polymorph, which also relates to the Druid's ability to wild shape. And even in a recent stream game that we did, uh, you had a trap that was a floor tile that if you reached in, there were a series of buttons, all but one had poison needles attached to them. And what my character ended up doing is polymorphing into a cockroach, crawling through the hole that the finger would go into, and looking up, seeing which of the buttons was right. not connected to a poison needle, climbing back out, and then pressing the right e button. E exactly. So there's a lot of different problem-solving ways that you can discover what the information is that you need to bypass a trap or open a, open a door or anything else like that. And I think, at the same time, I'm pretty sure that you pyromancers and barbarian players out there are just itching to tell the most obvious solution to any trap or locked door. Smash it, blow it up. Exactly. Yeah. There, objects can be damaged. Doors can be blown up. Um, I once played it in a D&D campaign where uh, there was a trap present and the barbarian stepped forward and said, I use disabled device. And I remember looking at the player oddly because I think that this was a third edition campaign. And, they, and then they prominently said, no, disabled device is the name of my Warhammer. <laughs> and sometimes that works. Now... <laughs> Again, to give points to the rogue, 
is what I will say is that a lot of what we're talking about is not the most silent option. Mm -hmm. But generally speaking, sometimes not all parties need to be silent to infiltrate. Yes. And actually, I think back to um, Skyrim with uh, when you join the, the Dark Brotherhood and there's the one character that's the big orc in the armor. And it's like, oh, you're in the Assassin's Guild, but we're all sneaky, stealthy people. And he's like, no, I go in and I smash them with an axe and leave nobody alive. And <laughs> that was his thing. He was still just as good of an assassin. And when we talk about infiltration, infiltration doesn't necessarily mean you're sneaky. A party that is a barbarian, a fighter, a paladin, and a monk... Well, the monk might be able to be the sneaky one who detects the trap or picks a lock. The barbarian is the one who's going to barrel down a hallway, set off yeah. the traps, and then kill the enemies who are alerted. I would say that's the difference between the spy or the commando style of infiltration, right? Like, there's there's kind of like that Sam Fisher, um, Metal Gear Solid, like, really don't be noticed sort of thing. And then there is, like, you're kind of going in guns blazing. That's still an infiltration but you're not really worried about who you're going to alert because you're just going to take them down. James Bond is an infiltrator, but in almost every case, he somehow ends up shooting his way out of uh, the place. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, to Also to give other fairness to the rogue, and I think it is worth mentioning this, is that with newer philosophies around skill challenges, I think that one of the merits to the rogue using their skills to interact with traps and using their tools to interact with traps is that they're not reliant on a limited number of spell slots or the dungeon master giving a favorable interpretation over how a spell is working. So in, in many ways, the rogue... I, I think I've said this before. The rogue is almost playing by the rules in the way that they work, and there is merit to that, especially once you have things like reliable talent, their high skill bonus. If you're worried about how your dungeon master is going to interpret or react to you using a spell in a creative way, they're probably going to be a lot less stringent about using of just straight up using disabled device or or, or pardon me thieves tools <laughs> but this also leads into a point that i think that there's a give and take with how this is all working at the table and i think the mm. dm is also part of this equation how is the dm ruling traps and locked yes. doors at the table and personally i think that the philosophy for dungeon design and how we look at the game of DD has evolved Absolutely. I think that if you look at earlier editions, particularly when you're going back as far as first edition, the interaction that players had with traps, and this is also true if you look at old school rule games and things like this, where players actually had to use their deductive reasoning to find and disable traps. They had to interact with the traps. And then we had this period that I think started maybe in late second edition, went through third edition, and definitely into fourth edition, where it was all about the only way to disable a trap is to roll the dice and see whether you beat the number, which is pretty frankly a boring and uninteractive way of dealing with traps. I think we're seeing this kind of resurgence of a more creative and interactive form of, in, of solving problems and interacting with the environment where dungeon masters are more regularly using things like skill challenges where the player characters have a variety of ways to interact with a trap and a variety of ways to disable it perhaps by layering a puzzle or a combat encounter over top of disabling the traps. I think that if you look at a lot of dungeons now, you very rarely see, like, in this hallway, there is a pit trap. The player characters must beat a DC 15. To like, you just don't see that. You see a bit of it. Yeah. But, but I think, like, it's more fun when you see something that's like a hallway that's like the gauntlet of traps. And how are they going to get past it? You kind of already know the traps are there, yeah. but are they going to use what spells, what abilities? How are they going to bypass it? And, and that, in our show, has been more interesting. Yeah, and I think it, it comes with this way of, of making a more meaningful encounter, making a more meaningful puzzle that just isn't really reliant on making skill checks and did you beat the DC. And I think that that's kind of the, the fundamental sort of flaw in the design philosophy of the Rogue and that sort of playstyle where... It's just about do you have the high enough numbers to open the lock or beat the trap, which a lot of people rightfully say is, is not a very exciting way of playing D&D. &D. We want things to be a little bit more imaginative than that. So the design philosophy that DMs are having and often adventures are having is to create more complex scenarios that require a little bit more puzzle solving where skills are still relevant. But often you look at them and you're like, 
there's no one skill that is the only solution, the only way to bypass this. And it really comes down to that whole thing of like, very rarely are you going to see a dungeon now where the only way past the door is to lo open the lock with these tools. You, you, that, that's actually, and most people, myself included, would consider that a poor design choice. Dungeon masters that are designing encounters and scenarios that require skills their party members don't have is also really out of favor now. Like, yeah, if, it, if you don't have a rogue in the party and you say, well, the only way past this dungeon is to pick the lock with thieves tools or to disable the trap with thieves tools, and you're in that party with the barbarian, the fighter, and the yeah. paladin, then you're you're not really designing a dungeon that allows your party to move forward. And if that barbarian says, what happens if I hit the door with an axe? And you say, it does nothing because it's a stone door and you need to pick the lock to open it to get into the dungeon. Well, what are you doing now? That's, now nobody can play your dungeon. Yeah, it's kind of a dead end at that point. So there's a bit of a back and forth here where, yes, the rogue is really good at disarming traps and and opening locked doors. But increasingly, if you want to create a scenario where the only way past that trap is to disable it with these tools, or the only way past that door is to unlock it with these tools, it's kind of a narrow design space. So that's where I think that this, this big, bigger idea of more creative sort of play, more interactive play, allowing for multiple different types of solutions and allowing for more characters to use those skills is is relevant. I don't think that it makes rogues useless or obsolete. Like, I think that that was one of those things that earlier editions really, the rogue was the only character who could do these things because it, that was seen as the only way to make the rogue relevant. Yeah. But I think that the game design is moving past that now. And I think as a final point on this, I think that as DMs, something that I love to do at my table is reward creative solutions. Yeah. When my party comes into a trap, and decides what if we use these spells, these abilities, these features, and they all use spider climb, teleportation, somebody tries to find the gears of the trap and uh, grab a chain that they found on the ground earlier and jam it in the gears, which I've seen happen at a game. And I'm like, you know what? That stops the wall that's moving towards yeah. you from moving. Because why not? Because it's good. It's good use of the surroundings. I think that most DMs now, when you're designing a trap or puzzle encounter, you kind of want to look at it from four axes. It's like, what if they try to break it? What if they try to disarm it? What if they try to bypass it? And what if they try to solve it? Um, and when you are designing a trap, because you're going to look at it those, those from four ways, it means inherently the rogue's ability is not the most important one anymore. It's just one of many different ways a party can solve those problems. So while that's relevant, I think that that kind of informs the perspective that we look at it from is that I think that most DMs now, many DMs are, are embracing increasingly this sort of design philosophy around building traps and building their puzzles. So as we wrap this all up, I think just to reiterate, the theory was that rogues are one of the best in the game at using thieves tools to disarm traps and pick locks and that still stays true they have an inherent baked in ability to be better at that than almost every mm -hmm. other class in the game now the misconception that we are trying to prove which i think we have here is that almost any other class has a means to deal with these same situations and unlike in previous editions which were a little more limited in the scope of how these were treated everybody at the table has a means of dealing with traps and locked doors. Some of them are louder than others, and some <laughs> parties won't care that they're being loud. Yeah. But also, turning into a ball of gas, you and your whole party, and drifting through the keyhole of a locked door and past the trapped hallway is a completely silent, silent and viable option. And I think that there are a lot of these options that your investigative wizard with pass wall knock and gaseous form is going to be a really good infiltrator. Your druid who has used a custom background to gain proficiency in thieves tools has wind walk and the ability to turn into small animals and slip through cracks is going to be really good at infiltrating. Your bard who has mm. a full spellcaster plus expertise plus their ability to gain thieves tools 
is going to be a really good infiltrator. Your rogues, even your fighters and barbarians and paladins have yeah. options. Yeah. I ran Tomb of Annihilation, a trap-heavy adventure for a party that did not have a rogue. Were there deaths? Yes. Were there deaths to traps? Yes. But the party still ultimately prevailed. Um, and so there is a back and forth. Um, rogues are great at it but they don't have the monopoly on disarming traps and unlocking doors. And even a smart and proficient rogue might often look for alternative ways to bypass or disable traps without necessarily having to be the one that goes right up to it and tries to disarm it and is the one running the risk of the whole thing blowing up in their own face. We're thinking of turning this into a series where we bust the myths of D&D 5e, so we'd love to hear your suggestions for other myths that you think that we should analyze, take a look at, and find out if there are more than one way to help everybody out in these situations in your games. Please let us know in the comments below. The videos that we create on our channel are made possible thanks to the incredible generosity of our Patreon supporters, many of whom who helped us workshop this video in our monthly Writer's Room series, where we share the scripts and outlines for our ups upcoming YouTube episodes with our patrons. They get a preview of that, and they can help contribute to finding new ideas. So a big thank you to everyone who participated in this week's uh, Writer's Room. You were a huge help in putting this episode together. And if you want to see me playing a rogue and having traps blow up in my face, you should check out our live play in the Worlds of Drakenheim, which airs Tuesday evenings on Twitch. You can find all the previous episodes right up over here. And we've got plenty more guides for players in 5th edition D&D right up over here. Please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time in, in the, the dungeon. dungeon.